thank you for coming out today. This is the first talk of the semester on the International and Comparative Laws uh, series, and we're really delighted, excited, ecstatic to have Professor Michael Thackeray here with us today from the University of Oregon, and he's speaking on the international legal form of sugar. Um, so without further ado, great, thanks Michael. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, thank you, John, for inviting me. I'm very excited to be in Jackson. Um, this is the first time I've been here. Um, so as John mentioned, I'm going to talk about sugar today. I'm going to talk about what we all know and have in our everyday life. And through this everyday commodity, I would understand how we build institutions and uh, around this is something we take almost for granted. Um, my talk today is based on a book that uh, should be coming out in the next year. Uh, the book will be called Sugar and the Making of International Trade Law. And as I mentioned, so the book focuses on the multilateral regulation of sugar uh, as a way to examine the institutional history of trade law. So the general purpose of my historical study is to understand what were the conditions that led people to want to invent and create multilateral institutions. Now the bulk of my talk today is going to focus on one treaty. I'm going to focus on one moment of time. And at the end, I'm going to address some of the thoughts I had completing the book, where the book left me. So I'm going to do something a bit unconventional. So I'm going to end with more questions and not answer them at all. That's the plan. <laughs> so my argument today is that one of the first modern multilateral trade institutions was the 1902 Sugar Treaty. Uh, the treaty was called the Brussels Sugar Convention, and the main signatories were the United Kingdom, France, Germany. Its primary purpose was to discourage governments from subsidizing sugar production. The main issue I'll talk about today is the institutional story. So what I mean by that is, these are the questions I'm asking when I mean the institutional story. How was international trade first organized by way of a multilateral treaty and an international institution? What does it mean to organize international trade through a multilateral treaty and international institution? And what was the context that led to this move to institutionalize international trade, especially since this occurred in the age of empire? So here's the plan for the talk. First, I'll explain by modern. Why am I calling the 1902 treaty modern? So this will give you, hopefully, a sense of where I'm coming from ideationally. Second, I'll outline the conditions from which the treaty institutions emerged from, the historical account. This is the story that I'll tell. And I'll end then with what do we do with this account? So before I delve in, let me give you a bit of where I'm coming from, sort of the background context of where I want, why I'm telling this story. So in the book, I actually start in the Neolithic era. I start 12,000 years ago. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to jump to something more recent, something very contemporary. I'm going to start with the 19th century, right, to bring us back to closer to today. But the reason I do that is the Neolithic era is really when humans started developing agricultural practice. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is situate international institutions. I'm trying to argue that to understand the history of international institutions, we have to understand agriculture. So if we situate international institutions within this longer history of, of agriculture, it's a very recent phenomenon. Okay? So let me bring us to the contemporary to the 19th century, the late 19th century. So in the late 19th century, what's going on, agricultural industrialization is spreading. So it starts in, in uh, primarily in England in the Industrial Revolution. It's a, the Industrial Revolution is an agricultural revolution, and it starts to spread to other parts of the world. Uh, so industrialization by now is also very profitable. People are making a lot of money with these new technologies and these new ways of producing goods and organizing uh, life in general. So as industrialization spread, so did capitalism. People, goods, and wealth are now traveling around the world at unprecedented speeds. Goods are being bought and sold on a global scale. And this was also when the British Empire was at the height of its power and territorial <coughs> scope. Now, imperialism, in my mind, is by definition not the highest form of capitalism. Right? This is a definition by Lenin and many others have taken up that definition. Rather, imperialism had a multitude of forms a multitude of justifications. Imperialism was a complicated idea and people were imperial for different reasons. But what unified everything at the time, it was difficult for anyone to imagine the world without empire. So there was a group of people that were called anti-imperialists 
But they weren't trying to dismantle the British Empire. What they were arguing against was the expansion of empire. So to understand the world at the time, everyone had a theory of empire somehow. And imperialism was driven by a dynamic of territorial expansion. So that's what I mean by uh, imperialism. And what happened was certain types of imperialisms served certain types of capitalism. You could be a capitalist and not care for imperialism and vice versa. But what I'm trying to understand is how those two concepts, those two dynamics informed and defined each other. And what I mean by capitalism is a drive for accumulating wealth for the purpose of generating more wealth. So in the age of empire, imperial overlords needed new modes of governance to rule on a global scale. People were imagining the world now as a domain to rule over. International law was one of those new modes of governance forged out of empire. So during the 1860s and 1870s, international law became the profession that we recognize today. To paraphrase, paraphrase Marty Koskiniemi, international law at this point in the 1860s and 1870s shifted from being the musings of professors, philosophers, and diplomats to become the practice of lawyers. There's another new mode of governance around this time, international institutions. Um, they emerge out of that same context of capitalism and imperialism. And today, when we talk about international law and institutions, we imagine them to be deeply intertwined. And we describe sometimes international institutions as lawmakers unto themselves. But that wasn't always so. This was the point where international institutions had their own history, and international law had its own history. It wasn't intertwined the way it was today. The history of international trade institutions is predominantly drawn from the practice of diplomats, politicians, civil servants, financiers, landowners, laborers, economists. There's very few lawyers in this history. Only with the creation of the WTO in 1994 did lawyers become important protagonists in the story of international trade institutions. So that's not to say there's no theory of law informing the work of these non-lawyers over the past century and how they designed and negotiated international trade institutions. But because most of these people were not lawyers, today's trade law doesn't really focus on this history. But they did have their own concept and theory of what is law and what is law's relationship to commerce, um, institutions, and the like. So in my study, Sugar allows me to keep track of law, international institutions, capitalism, and imperialism. These are all big, grand, vague co concepts, but sugar keeps me grounded, and sugar lets me to see where those ideas are connecting. It allows me to see how they're always changing and configuring and interacting. Right? So that's sort of the big overview. That's sort of where a lot of my questions and, and, and intuitions are coming from. So let me bring it back to this very particular treaty, to the 1902 treaty, to the Brussels Convention. So why am I calling this convention, this 1902 treaty, modern? So first, it was very peculiar for its own time. Um, it was very distinct from other trade treaties of the time. So you have things like, if you were to open up a trade law textbook, often they'll mention something like the 1860, eight, excuse me, 1860, Cobden Chevalier Treaty. This was a treaty between the United Kingdom and France. But for my purposes of trying to understand multilateral institutions, it's not that interesting because there's a bilateral treaty. You reduce your tariffs, we'll reduce our tariffs, and we'll all go home and go on with our business. There was uh, a couple of other treaties. You have the 1815 Central Commission for the Navigation on the Rhine. It was about a, a river. You have the 1885 General Act of the Berlin Conference on West Africa which is part of the scramble for Africa, also sometimes noted as an early uh, multilateral institution. But what's interesting about those treaties is it's regulating trade by uh, negotiating territorial access and rights. It's understanding trade in terms of spatial terms. What's curious about the 1902 Sugar Treaty is it regulated the production and distribution of an actual good and it did so through a multilateral institution. The other thing that um, makes me uh, call this uh, 1902 Treaty modern is how um, this institution had its own notion of power. 
So at the time, you had all these things. Uh, the trend in 1815 to 1913 was to create these international administrative unions or public international unions. And these were thought to be technical unions administrating the global machinations of things like communication, transportation, measurement, public health, intellectual property. And it was mostly engineers, scientists, what we would call now technocrats. But the 1902 Brussels Convention was thought to be, one, uh, one scholar called it curious and anomalous. Um, it was curious and anomalous for its own time because it created a permanent commission and this permanent commission exercised an unprecedented amount of power over signatory states. The permanent commission was one of the few public international unions whose decisions directly forced the state to change its domestic laws. And it did, uh, it did this through a system of monitoring and sanctions. So this uh, power to determine policy led the few scholars of international organizations of the late 19th century to consider the Brussels Convention as an exemplar for other institutions. Now the third thing that makes it modern uh, in my mind is its legal structure um, and the institution that it created. It almost looks like the WTO. It has a most favored nation clause and what that means in trade law is that a country is to treat all other signatory countries equally in terms of uh, levels of duties and tariffs. It regulated against subsidies. It allowed for countervailing duties and retaliation. It addressed matters like like products. The question is, are biscuits like jam? They both have sugar. Do we treat them like uh, analogous products? And it had a permanent secretariat that had a dispute resolution function. If you had a dispute with another country, another signatory country, you would take your complaint, complaint to, the, uh, to the permanent commission. Now, many at the time worried that these powers were too expansive and it, that they interfered with state sovereignty. But what's interesting is to look at the, the words of a member of the German Reichstag at the time. His, his argument captures the sentiments that supported the sugar treaty. And this is what he said, quote, in answer to the question raised as to why we should allow the foreigner to interfere in German tariff legislation, he is not interfering with us any more than we are with his. Every tariff and commercial treaty binds both parties and cannot be looked upon as undue interference of a third party. This is almost like our discussions of globalization today. What I mean by that is there's, a, there's an assumption that the world is deeply economically interconnected and thus we need to create a new technology, a multilateral institution is, is necessary to manage this interconnected world. Right? This is, this is a, it's a very contemporary sentiment. Now what's interesting for our purposes is that everyone at the time was very careful to say what this treaty does is it doesn't create its own law. They kept referring to the powers of the permanent commission and the powers emerging from the treaty as policy. And it would always reiterate that only a state can create law. Very few public international lawyers had much to say about this treaty. Um, those few that did would always, again, reiterate this is not law. Uh, so for example, one of the few legal studies about this treaty at the time said, look, when a commission is engaged in a dispute between two parties, this is not, uh, this is not the commission acting as a governing authority. Rather, the jurist argued, this is more like an ad hoc arbitration tribunal, where it's about an agreement between litigants to go to a, a third party to resolve their dispute. The disputes themselves were often framed as questions of fact and interpretation, rather than law uh, and politics. There was also trepidation in granting the commission full recognition as a diplomatic force unto itself much less uh, any sort of legal personality. So as a consequence, uh, according to the treaty, the commission was to communicate to all the other member states through the Belgian government. Because the treaty was negotiated uh, in Brussels, the Belgian government, a state, was to act as the intermediary. That way communication was, diplomatic communication was always state to state, sovereign to sovereign. So, to summarize, this was not understood at the time as international law proper. Rather, 
It was about the management of domestic law, what we might call comparative law, or even transnational law. So there's a theory of law there. Um, but again, public international lawyers just didn't recognize it as something that they were to worry about. So now, having explained why I think it's, it's uh, fair and appropriate to call this sugar institution modern, the next question arises in my mind is, how did this modern institution come about in the era of imperialism? Implicit in this question is that the social and political context of these legal doctrines matter. And so to begin to answer that question, I'll go to my second point in terms of what interests were involved that led to the creation of this institution. So in my research, I outlined the intellectual and socioeconomic conditions that led to the creation of the 1902 treaty. And I examined two dynamics. The first uh, dynamic that I look at is, are the free trade debates in the United Kingdom in the late 19th century. The other element I look at is the social history of sugar production. So there were a slew of competing interests at play at the time. So let me introduce the characters. You had West Indian colonial governors, West Indian sugar plantation workers, many of whom were former slaves or their parents were slaves. You had British consumers, British confectioners. And when I say confectioners, there's a huge industry in the United Kingdom at the time in terms of producing jams, chocolates, candies. Around the same time, Cadbury's and Roundtree incorporate. They shift from being a family business to corporations. So there's a different legal story at play there. You had British imperial interests. Uh, you had continental European sugar producers. You had continental sugar consumers. So I took all these different interests and all these different characters, and I juxtaposed them against the primary material surrounding the treaties. And to, to me, this, this exemplifies how institutionalizing is a process that excludes, prioritizes, and suppresses certain ideas and interests. It organizes all these ideas and interests in a very particular way. So the heart of the matter is a tension, a fight, a conflict between sugar cane and sugar beet. The main conflict was between sugar cane growers in the British West Indies and the sugar beet growers in continental Europe. The Europeans had been subsidizing sugar since the time of Napoleon, and they still subsidize sugar. It's one of the few times in history you draw a nice straight line from Napoleon to the EU. The West Indian colonial governors were complaining to London that this subsidization garnered an unfair advantage, that it was government interference into the world market price of sugar. It destabilized the price of sugar. So already we see that they had an assumption of what a, a fair market is, of what the natural market is, and they were arguing that we needed to correct this market. And what they asked for and what they got was an international treaty. So this, the 1902 Sugar Treaty's main purpose was to disallow government subsidies of the sugar industry. So the question to me was, well, why didn't the West Indian colonial governors just lobby London for government subsidization as a permanent policy. Why did they just ask for money like the European, the continental Europeans got? Why would the continental European states sign a treaty restricting their own ability to subsidize domestic sugar production? And it's here we start to see the power of ideas regarding the political economy. What we see is how these ideas define what was thought possible, feasible, desirable. So let's, let me focus a bit more on, on the British uh, uh, ideational debates at the time. So in popular British political economy of the time, they were, in general, against the idea of subsidization. That government subsidization created uncertainty and it destroyed industries that were not favored by the state. Subsidization was a financially ridiculous policy, and if those silly continentals wanted to do that, that was their fault. What they were worried about was the, uh, was the West Indies. The economic improvement of the West Indies was not out of the benevolence of the heart to improve the conditions of the workers of the time. It was about ensuring the political stability of the colonies. What's going on in the West Indian colonies of the time are workers are burning the fields 
workers are protesting in, in, in the streets, um, there's political and social instability, and the British Empire is at stake. So the thinking was, if, if from the British perspective in London, if we lose the West Indies, we lose, that, we lose the empire. Thus, what they wanted to do is employ free trade ideas and doctrine to buttress the British Empire, a free trade imperialism, if you will. So why were the British so afraid of the workers? Well, one reason was, as I mentioned, the empire. But the other reason was what they were calling at the time fear of the Negro uprising. The British Crown and Parliament and, and policymakers were afraid of former slaves revolting and seeking independence. In their mind was the Haitian Revolution of 1791 to 1803, where the black community successfully fought for independence. In their mind was the Morant Bay Rebellion in Jamaica in 1865 and the worker revolts that I mentioned that were going on from 1884 up until around 1902. So that's the perspective from London. What about the West Indian colonial governors? So they thought, as I mentioned, that European subsidization is an unfair advantage. It's undue government interference into the market. They had a distinct sense of where the line is between state and market. So their assumption is that an international agreement that disallowed government subsidies would stabilize the sugar market, and that this would encourage private investment, private capital into the West Indian sugar industry. Once they got that private capital, they could update their technology and they could catch up and compete with the Europeans who were far more technologically advanced at this point because they had been receiving subsidies since the time of, uh, of Napoleon. So that's the West Indian colonial uh, governor perspective. Now, what about the continental Europeans? They weren't against subsidization as such. Rather, they felt that after decades of subsidizing the continental sugar industry, the beet industry, that it had developed enough technological innovation that it could compete now without government help. This is what we would call today infant, an infant industry argument that let us subsidize and help the small infant industry until it matures and then stop those subsidies and allow it to compete on the world market. Alexander Hamilton was one of the first uh, developers of this idea. Now what happened, however, is it became too expensive for the government to continue to subsidize sugar, beet sugar, in continental Europe, but the beet sugar uh, group, I won't call it a lobby, had a lot of political power. It was politically difficult to wean the beet sugar industry off of these subsidizations. Moreover, consumers were furious, continental consumers were furious in terms of how expensive sugar was. The system of subsidies meant that it was the consumer who was paying for subsidizing the domestic uh, beet industry, and there was all this delici delicious chocolate in England that they wanted to get at. All joking aside, sugar had become a staple of, of people's diet. For example, in the, I think around the mid 18th century, when uh, sugar prices had skyrocketed, people took to the streets in France and rioted, demanding cheaper sugar, because this was part of everyday uh, eating. Moreover, the British were starting to threaten to disallow the entry of subsidized sugar into the British market, and the British were the largest consumers in the world. If the beet sugar industry wanted to survive, it needed access to the British market. So how did this play out in terms of the treaty and in terms of legal configuration? Well, the, the treaty took the British position as the rule, the norm, meaning that government subsidization was to be phased out for all signatories of the treaty. The continental position was the exception. Non-signatory countries that had an underdeveloped sugar industry could, could subsidize their industry. But if you subsidize your sugar industry, you are not allowed to export your sugar to a signatory country. Um, and these signatory countries comprise the majority of sugar consumers. So if you wanted to grow and develop an infant industry and keep it within your domestic market, that was allowed as an exception. But the minute you wanted to enter the, the normal market, and I put normal between scare quotes, then you had to stop subsidizing. This meant also 
that even if a country did not want to sign, didn't sign the treaty, and they wanted access to the largest sugar consuming market in the world, in the United Kingdom, they had to change the economic and legal structure of their sugar production. Argentina is an example. They never signed the treaty, but they changed their laws um, in response to the treaty. The only signatory countries that were allowed to subsidize were explicitly enumerated, Spain, Italy, and Sweden. And no one thought that they were going to develop much of the sugar industry. And I think they were right. I don't think Sweden makes sugar these days. <laughs> So what were the effects of the treaty? Well, one effect of the treaty is it did actually generate an increase of investment into the West Indies. And this happened in light of the news of the signing of the treaty. So the idea was that the treaty it was more important to attract capital. The idea of the treaty was more important to attract capital. So even before the treaty was signed, investors started um, putting some money into the West Indies. The actual operation of the treaty itself wasn't necessarily the determinative factor. The treaty also had global repercussions. Um, everyone assumed that the treaty would support and promote the British um, imperial uh, control over the West Indies. Whether you supported the treaty or you were against the treaty, the agreement was this is going to help sugarcane growers in the West Indies. But what did not seem to have been anticipated was latecomers to the treaty, such as Peru, non-signatories, as I mentioned, such as Argentina, would benefit from the treaty more than the West Indies. It's because they had subsidized their local sh sugar industry in the past, but now they did away with domestic subsidies in order to gain access to the world's largest consumer market, the UK. Um, and so they were able to enter the market with a well-developed, technologically and economically um, competitive sugar market. Similarly, Cuba and Hawaii benefited from preferential access to Hawaii, uh, to the United States, benefited from the treaty because of that preferential access to the United States. That's what buttressed their local sugar industry. And they could now expand into the European market. So the Brussels Convention may have actually hampered the West Indies and the sugar industry in the West Indies. The West Indies never really benefited from subsidies, and their techno they were always technologically less advanced than all these other sugar industries. This meant that the Brussels Convention had the effect of kicking away the ladder from under the feet of the West Indian sugar producers, since they could now never subsidize their industry even if they wanted to. They could never match the industrial efficiency of others unless private capital could step up to catch up after decades of subsidization. The treaty's effects were not uh, uh, just political and economic in the sense of how the production of sugar was affected, but it also was ideational. The treaty influenced ideas and definitions of free trade. The sugar treaty provided credence to the notion that subsidies are an unnatural intervention into the market and that countervailing duties are necessary to discourage subsidies. So to bring you into the ideational debates of the time, you had two groups in England that were battling vehemently for and against the Brussels Convention. And they were both arguing over who had the true interpretation of free trade. No one at the time, very few people at the time, were really anti-free trade. The argument was framed as what does free trade mean and who had the truest definition. So you had one group called the Anti-Bounty League, and bounty at the time was the word for subsidies. And they argued that countervailing duties were necessary to equalize the unfair advantage provided to sugar producers who received subsidies from the government. You had another group called the Cobden Club, and they argued that if governments subsidize their sugar industry, again, we've heard this before, this is their folly, and that countervailing duties, so countervailing duties is a measure to impose taxes and duties uh, to counteract the amount of subsidies. So that countervailing duties were a dangerous intervention by the government into the market. So again, it's a difference of definition over the line between state and market. This debate is still live today. The WTO has a very similar system of countervailing duties and a bias against subsidization, uh, subsidization but lawyers and economists still argue whether the WTO should be in the business of regulating against domestic regulation. 
against domestic subsidization. What happened after the treaty, after, the, after 1902, within the Cobden Club, within the Cobden Club that was inherently against the treaty, you start to see arguments and debates at these different free trade conferences that are now happening at, on an international scale. And people would reference the Brussels Convention as an example of liberal trade, of free trade. They would point to this agreement and say, look, this is an exemplar of free trade, which we are uh, in favor of. They would say, this trade agreement restricts artificial pampering of an industry, and it reduced domestic taxes on sugar in continental Europe, thereby increasing consumption. Um, and similar characterizations of the Brussels Convention as a liberal trade treaty were made throughout the first half of the 20th century. So let me conclude with what do we do with all this history? So as I mentioned in the beginning, um, these are debates that are historical, but I think have a, a very modern feel to them. And I've made references to the WTO. In trade negotiations, agriculture is one of the most contentious issues in the current round of, of negotiations. Um, and the debates uh, are going to sound similar. Uh, in the simplest term, developing countries want developed countries to stop subsidizing their domestic agriculture and want them to reduce their agricultural tariffs. Uh, many developing countries still depend on agricultural exports. Um, and for a while there was a debate in WTO law whether agriculture is an important aspect of trade law or whether we should focus on manufactured products or not. Now that debate is back and everyone agrees that we need to figure out agriculture and without figuring out agriculture we're never going to change uh, trade law, we're actually getting back in my mind to what matters in trade law. We're getting back to negotiations that be began really during the peak of the British Empire. But I want to end on newer questions. I want to end, um, and, it, and as I mentioned, you know, this is a bit risky, but I think the political stakes are high enough in trade that it's worth taking these risks. And it's worth fighting over what questions matter. So this is why I want to end with new questions. So a lot of what I'm trying to do in the book is to provide a fresh institutional context. I'm trying to provide a different sense of space and time for trade law. So to me that means that putting forward the appropriate context is not self-evident. It's an argument. So broadly speaking, an argument regarding which institutions matter reveals one's own intuitions about what constitutes society. So in my book, when I'm suggesting that there's these three trade agreements and that they're one of the most defining multilateral institutions of trade law, the 1902 Brussels Convention, so the other two that I talk about in the book are a 1937 International Sugar Agreement uh, negotiated under the auspices of the League of Nations and the 1977 International Sugar Agreement negotiated under the United Nations Conference of Trade and Development. So when I say these three multilateral institutions are central to trade law, what I'm suggesting is that trade law is constantly about redefining capitalism and imperialism, about negotiating between agriculture and industry. Whereas if you look at trade law the way it's often taught or um, the way it's been studied for the last couple of decades, they'll focus on the, what's called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT. What I think is, uh, I think a propensity for GATT arises from a partiality for manufactured products. It also probably stems from an assumption that capitalism is inevitable and that imperialism is historically extraneous to trade law. So when I provide a century's worth of trade law and institutions through the story of sugar, what I'm doing is I'm focusing on the set of range of possibilities through which people made their choices about and through law. And here, I'm, and I hope uh, this, you know, this, I've captured this, that it's a tension between different groups coalescing as agricultural interests and different groups coalescing as industrial interests. Now the people in politics that make up these interests has always been multifaceted. So we can, I can say agriculture, well who do I mean by that? And international trade law has been built upon the equality, has been built upon the inequality amongst, we can define it as agricultural producers, industrial consumers. 
or small countries, large countries, workers on the land, owners on the land, former black slaves, remaining white bosses, colonial subjects, imperial overlords, third world, first world. We answer the question of who in very different ways uh, throughout time. Nevertheless, the assumption held by architects of trade institution has been, for the most part, that agriculture's principal purpose in the world is to serve industry. It didn't matter who you were in, these, in this matrix of people. A deep assumption is we, agriculture's drive is to serve industry. And trade law has been part of that larger development plan whose end goal is to use the financial gains from agriculture to industrialize. So here's the question I want to leave with. Well, what if we no longer privilege the idea of industry? What if we no longer privilege the attendant values of industry, which to me are things like mechanical speed, economic growth? What if we use agriculture as an ideational starting point? What does that even mean? Right? The distinction between agriculture and industry is becoming blurry. It's and, and even blurrier. So we see an increasing rate of patented seeds, chemical fertilizers, mechanized monocrop farming. But this is a blurriness, an, op an opacity that makes agriculture look more like industry every day. So after an age of industrialization, the questions that might open up the horizon possibilities may very well be, how could we interpret and change trade law in a way that assumes that industry should serve or resemble agricultural practices. What does it mean to think about agriculture as an end in and of itself? So in answering these questions, we may want to explore agricultural practices that consider different values, such as ecological resilience, biological diversity, and maybe with these ideas we can transform our future. Thank you very much. We have about 15 minutes for Q&A, if anyone wants any questions. I mean, you don't have to phrase it as a, as a question, just sort of thoughts and, and conversation. I do prefer chatting <laughs> than this back and forth. We're going to cut the tape anyway, if you'd like, and just have your talk so it could be something really informal. Yeah, I mean, whatever works for, for people. I mean, I just presented about 100 years worth of ideas. <laughs> Uh, over food, nonetheless. <laughs> what, what, when you say that the difference between agriculture and industry, what do you mean? I mean, where it's like, you know, uh, how, how, what, what's the divide between the two? What defines one versus the other? Yeah, so that's where I, that's where I use the, I'd say it's blurry. It's hard to make that distinction. So that's why I start using the word of practice and, and, and values. So even, so what I would rather ask, start with the question of how do we grow X? rather than how do we make more, or how do we produce more, or how do we sell more? Start with the growing question. And then we have to ask, well, who, who is it? Who are the agricultural interests? So not to say that there isn't uh, financiers and industrial work, and anyone who's seen a farm or a garden or anything, you have to have some element of industrialization. But I think the, the, if we start with a question of how do we grow something, versus how do we make something might shift an emphasis in a way that I'm not sure where it'll go, but it'll go somewhere different. And it'll, it'll highlight different people, right? It brings in different people. So when you, when you talk about agriculture, then the, the workers are in, in, in agriculture, and I almost said agricultural industry, and that says something already there, right? My, my slip. But who, who the workers are, the geography start, starts to change, right? even with, on a commodity by commodity basis, right? So in, sh in the story of sugar, it was the West Indies, it was former slaves, but if I told the story of wheat, it might be serfs in Russia, maybe, right? So that, the sociological element, uh, it'll highlight a different element of the story. Whereas in industry, I mean, not, you, have, you have workers and you have different players and you have inequality, but it's a story where, for me, it, it's a depressing story. It's a story that we, it's run, it's, we know that's a tragedy. We know the story of industrialization and the story of inequality. I mean, the shock to the system of the Industrial Revolution generated texts 
from people that now we say, oh, these are the defining texts of political economy, starting from Adam Smith, ending with Karl Marx, we're all reacting to the machine in some way. Rather, and we still have that embedded in our traditions and, and literature. Well, what if we create a different history where it's people whose first thought was not a fear or reaction or frustration with the machine. Rather, it's, I need to grow my sugar beet today, and I need to get water, I need to get nutrients, I need to think about how this relates to the cattle. That's just a different arrangement. Uh, actually, I actually have two questions. One was uh, just brought up from what you said, because when you talk about growing, it seems that uh, there's an underlying aspect of being a matter of control of variables. Industry has far more control over its variables than agriculture ever will, because agriculture is so much more linked to weather and so much more linked to environmental considerations. So it seems that uh, it, when you say the word grow, you naturally bring that in, which I, I like. Um, I want to go back to the quote you used at the beginning of your speech when you talked about an external force applying or altering domestic law. And uh, it seems to bring out to me two critical differences in looking at international law. There's international law that is linked to the threat of force. <laughs> and then there's international law that appears to be uh, focused entirely on reciprocity. Mm. And, and I'm not sure law is the right word to apply to both, but the quote I take issue with because it's not really an external force that is causing domestic change. It is merely, if we do not make a domestic change voluntarily, they will make their own domestic change that will have a negative effect on us. They get to say, we're not gonna buy your good because you're not buying ours, or vice versa. That's really the fundamental concept mm. from the 19 or 1802 treaty all the way to the 2005 WTO decision on sugar. It really isn't a, the WTO doesn't get to step in and say, your government's criminal, we get to put people in jail, or we get to change it. Right. All they can do is say, you, other country, you now have moral high ground to kick in subsidies or kick in a tariff yourself. Right. So I think this is where, this is where, this is why I made this distinction. Or thank you so. So let me let, let me start from. So this idea of growth. So you're right that a lot when we talk about agriculture, there's an element of controlling forces beyond us, nature, how we're defined. So a lot of this the story of sugar over the last hundred years is about trying to control the fluctuation of prices in light of this um, instability. So. The, the, the tension in agriculture is what do we do with inherent instability and there's a, there's, it, it, but, but because it's serving industrialization, it's a desire to control it. Right. Where I end with is an idea of resilience, which is a very different concept. So I'm also reacting to the history of control. I think more and more people are suspicious of our ability to control nature, rather we need to find our way, our, uh, reimagine our relationship with it. So on this notion of control though, so unlike other parts of, you know, you know, we treat international law more coherently now, international law at that time was like you said, war um, and those sorts of dynamics. This is, these are business people trying to regulate. So the word is regulation, which isn't just control, it's well, we all agree what are the basic uh, assumptions and conditions we need of stability in order to do business, right? And so it complicates the concept of private and public as well, right? We're using a public international treaty, we have sovereign states about their tariffs, uh, regulating private commerce. And the, the power of this treaty and of the WTO is it's not just moral high ground, that then if, in this case, in terms of subsidies, if you are found to be subsidizing sugar in a way that contravenes the terms of the treaty, then the permanent commission will say, you, a complaining country, are now, we give you legitimacy and authority. We enable you, we empower you to impose countervailing duties and raise your duties against the subsidizing country in a way that we've all agreed is legitimate. So it lends legitimacy and what's curious is that it shifts the emphasis that international institutions aren't necessarily the product of states, but that international institutions are now empowering and defining state power. It goes both ways, right? So what it says is your domestic law is illegal. That's your, that's your prerogative. It's not an external force. That's why I say it's not international law. It's not, 
It's management and regulation. It's more the language of private law um, and market and market regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mike, I have two questions. So one is, okay, so you have this, you said you go back, not in your talk. So this is not about your talk. Here's my two questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's first right. is, if we're going back to uh, the Neolithic era, right? So in that sense, and I think this is an unfair thing to say, but if we're going to trace sugar over that period of time, it almost becomes a Hegelian geist that, man that reveals itself in human history to understand how people, but it's not a Hegelian geist, it's something actually real and stuff. And so my first question is, so if you're going to trace it for that long of a time, how do you possibly look, if it's so specific, the constellation of power and relations, mm. and you have this incredibly rich and dense study in the 19th, or late 19th, early 20th century, right. how do you do that across time without falling into the traps that you're critiquing? And then second, yeah. I'm just wondering how yeah, yeah. you're methodologically doing That's that. That's a great question. And then secondly, on a similar source, like so we talked about some of the ideational background material for why people did things uh, in the late 19th, and so I have a question for you. One is, if the first half of the 20th century was as much about getting distribution right as getting prices right, and yet this treaty really looks like it's getting prices right. Mm -hmm. Though really it's distribution, getting prices right, right? How did that happen, right? So there's one story of development, which is this is the period of getting distribution right. Mm. But in your story, it says no, right? It's getting prices right. And so I wonder about that and now. So if we were going to move forward with these questions, are there people we should read? Are there some, like what would be a beginning bibliography of someone who goes, this is a really convincing argument. I like these questions. I need to go read this book and then read up on new stuff for how to think about agriculture in the future. What would you suggest? Where where could we look? Right. So on the, the Neolithic, so I don't trace sugar to the Neolithic. I just so what I the reason I take it back, the reason I situate international institutions in within the history of agriculture is to make something that we take for granted, the international institution, and this is a classic move, to appear strange. How peculiar. What an odd way to organize trade. What an odd way to organize agriculture. Right? So the history of sugar doesn't start 12,000 years ago. The history of sugar starts as a wild grass in, in um, Southeast Asia. It gets picked up, and I wish I had what year, my, my years get a little fuzzy here, but it gets picked up by Arab traders. It gets picked up by Arab traders through Persia, and then they start growing sugar in um, Eastern Mediterranean and the like, what's today, I guess, the Levant, um, and, and it becomes part of the diet there. Then it gets to Europe in two different ways. One, through the Moors, through Spain bringing it with them. Two, through the Crusaders. They come back and they say, you won't believe what we just found. <laughs> this stuff is crazy addictive. <laughs> and it enters the diet of the European royalty at first. And there's a German saying at that point, and I'm not going to say it in German because I don't speak German, but the translation is, uh, sugar spoils no dish. And it eventually enters then the everyday diet. And here's where the history of sugar, the, what caught my attention with sugar specifically, is a, a book by Sidney Mintz called Sweetness and Power. So Sidney Mintz is a, is a, a well-known anthropologist, and I highly recommend this book. It's written in a very accessible way. And it was just one phrase. He writes it. It's a history of more on the consumption side of sugar. And this one, one small passage struck me. He said, look, if you look at the Industrial Revolution in England, where it all really began in terms of industrialization, you see that the workers are drinking sweet tea. The reason the British were one of the largest consumers of sugar is because of how they drank their tea. Now, the, why are the workers drinking tea? Because tea with caffeine and sugar, it's fuel. It's fueling the laborer. And the caffeine suppresses your appetite. So what he says is this. It's unclear whether it was a taste for sweet tea that enabled the Industrial Revolution because sweet tea is kind of delicious. <laughs> or, we believe that anyway. <laughs> or whether it's the Industrial Revolution that 
demanded a consumption habit in that sense. He leaves it open, and it's hard to, and I think it's good to leave it open. So again, to go back, so by putting by putting it in the terms of agriculture, it makes me ask, why did we why did we invent this thing? We didn't have to. We've been we've been growing and trading for a long, long time. This makes it seem like more immediate history. So that's that's it's a strategic or rather tactical move to, to, move, to play on Rob Knox's work. Well, and your second question was about... Yeah. So where would we go if we were interested in reading new stuff? Right. Or so, reading around this, what would you suggest? You so I would suggest there's two, there are two books that up until the 1980s, if you did trade law and you were worried about agriculture, all you cared about were international commodity agreements. And international commodity agreements have been more or less forgotten in the history of trade law. So there's no, there's no theory as to why did we create these commodity agreements. And these commodity agreements were really popular from the League of Nations, from the 20s and 30s up until the 1980s. So we have about 50 years of trade law, which we have no strong theoretical foundation for. The two, there are two legal treatises on commodity agreements writ large. Um, in the 80s. One was by V.S. Chimney, who is a, an eminent international jurist and still quite active. And the other uh, was by a Pakistani a scholar named uh, Kabir Abdul Rahman Khan, who taught at the University of Edinburgh uh, and uh, passed away in the 90s. Um, they write these two books that have this history. Um, I found, how did I find this sugar tree in Khan's book? He just mentions it and talks about it. I'm like, what is this thing that I've never been taught? And through their work, they end in the 80s. So in a way, what I'm trying to do in this book is to change what we read in trade law, what counts as the so-called canon. And I would start with Chimney and Khan. Um, both of them, and in and, and Khan's work, he does some excellent primary research. I've tried to hunt down the documents he used, and it's, it's quite difficult. He did some great research there. And my book, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and anywhere to go in the future, like if we were thinking about agriculture in different ways? So this is where, so this is where I have, I always worry. So there's a worry in, in one's research to, you know, when I started this research, I got interested in trade law in 1999. I was a student activist and was organizing protests and putting people on buses to Seattle. And I did study trade law, got you know, the highest mark in trade law, and then I realized I don't even know what the WTO is. I have no <laughs> clue what I'm so angry about. And that's why I'm a trade lawyer, is to try and understand that. That's what this is all about, is to understand what is this weird, weird thing. Um, so. I try to figure out a way, so I don't touch the WTO, but this is all me trying to get there at some point, of trying to understand why we have institutions. The danger is then to say, well, where we go next, now that I know institutions so much more, is to stay in the realm of institutions. I'm trying to build, so where my research is going is looking at social movements. I'm trying to build in a corrective, a self-corrective, critiquing myself next, to not fetishize and not be always preoccupied with institutions. That being said, there's still a part of me that loves, there's a lot of power in, in who gets to decide the question. Institutions define questions and agendas. So I think this is an interesting time to recapture international commodity agreements. They exist. It's, it's wonderful. There's zombies out there. There's these structures. There's a sugar agreement and a cocoa agreement and a, all of these agreements. But they're called now our administrative agreements. They're a place where people share information, but they don't have any bite in terms of enforcement or saying anything about your domestic law. Very technocratic and, and the like. But you have these structures there. You have these histories there. One, so you have infrastructure. Two, you have the intellectual infrastructure with some of the texts I mentioned. Three, what else do you need to change the world? Money. During the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the part I, uh, when I talk about the 1977 Sugar Agreement, it was part of the rise of the Third World. There was something called the New International Economic Order, and that they created through UNCTAD, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, was something called the Common Fund for Commodities. Through OPEC, through oil money, 
they would take a small percentage and fund what they wanted to do is regulate the world's commodities through one institution. We do that now with the WTO. At the time, that was considered radical. At the time, to, put, to regulate all of international trade agricultural law through one institution was a radical move. That fund still exists. That money's just sitting there. We should just take it and run. <laughs> so you've got intellectual foundation. You've got institutional structure. You've got a little bit of financial structure. You've got now food politics are on the agenda of many people. So many activists and many people who are being politicized aren't coming through traditional roots of civil rights or human rights. They're coming at it through food and it's redefining politics. People who are, are finding that f food politicizes in, in a way that they might have not been political actors otherwise. So you've got a bit of that energy as well. And we'll see where we'll go. Can we wrap it up? Is that okay? I don't want to have the... Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.